today? Well, this is our second train. We're heading back to Cairo or maybe Giza uh, from Luxor. We're old hands now because this is our second train journey. We're waiting for the 910, which should roll in from Aswan. We're in carriage one, seat 38 and 39. That looks tasty. Yep, the food on the Egyptian trains is surprisingly tasty. We actually tried this on our way to Aswan and you get this yummy rice, what appears to be a quarter of a chicken, bread, olives and something sweet. That's really good. A quarter of a chicken? It must be a very big chicken. Okay, maybe a half. <laughs> our time in Egypt because we've had quite a few people ask us about the logistics of travelling there. So the first thing we thought we'd talk about was the accommodation. So I thought the accommodation was pretty good really, wasn't it? Um, our first hotel we stayed in had a really nice big room, uh, very high ceilings, good bathroom, air conditioning, those kinds of things. The only downside of it was that the access to it was a little bit hairy and it did smell quite a bit of cat. Um, our accommodation in Aswan the first night wasn't so flash because we had problems with the air conditioning unit but we found a really nice um, island resort which was surprisingly cost effective and we had a really great sort of five or six nights there um, and our hotel in Luxor was excellent. We found that looking at reviews was really helpful so TripAdvisorBooking.com have really good reviews about places and you can sort of filter through them all and um, yeah the accommodation is affordable you can stay at whatever level you want really but we had no problems with finding places to stay. Our hotel room in Cairo, big high ceilings, very adequate bathroom. We are paying the princely sum of about 19 British pounds for this. So for the princely sum of 38 pounds a night we have this enormous big room and if you look out here we've got this amazing balcony with an awesome view of the Nile. So come this way. This is how you install a air conditioning unit on the outside of your hotel. Hang on tight, don't get distracted by the pyramids in the background. Don't waste money on scaffolding. And transport. We basically used three types of transport. It was car, or taxi, or trains, and there was the boat on the Nile. Um, all very different to the moment, of course, and the internet was our friend. So with taxis, we, we used Uber. Um, it was brilliant because it obviously it worked, but it also gave us a price indication. So even if there wasn't an Uber driver handy, we knew roughly what the price was. Um, it wasn't available everywhere, though, was it? Not everywhere. Yeah. Not everywhere. But very good for Cairo. Yeah. Um, the trains, um, our big win there was booking online. Once we booked online, it was really easy, we just sort of flashed our ticket, wandered in, sure enough our seat was waiting for us. The hardest part was actually getting logged on online. But if you persevere, just keep pushing away at the buttons, sooner or later something, yeah. something will fall into place. Yeah. It's worth persevering. Yeah, I gave up very easily on that bit, but yeah, Neil was very good at persevering. Yeah. And the third one um, was our trip down the Nile, and this is where the internet is not your friend. If you go online, um, you'll find all the, um, the boats that are cruising up around the Nile. They've all got very fancy web pages with very fancy prices. But often the boats are not full. So when we went to Aswan, I just went down to the docks and hung about there. And sure enough, people approached you asking what you wanted. Do you want a full loop or ride? Or in our case, we wanted a cruise. And we were sort of on, not on standby, but um, they quickly made some phone calls and found where there were spaces. So we paid 40 US dollars a night. We had all the food under the sun. That included um, tours to the temples and, and all the rest of it, um, so, as well as the transport, yeah. uh, basically in a floating hotel. So that was well worth it. And 
the people who were on the boat with us, they were paying $100, $150 a night. So if you are an asthma, just go down to the docks and hang around there. Mm. And I've got to admit, I was really sceptical about the whole thing, but yeah, I was wrong. It's, it's definitely worth doing, and other people have told us that too. but there's no shortage of good food. We found on the boat in particular we had um, three buffet meals a day so we didn't go hungry there but we became big fans of koshery which is the pasta, rice, noodle, chickpea concoction with a spicy tomato sauce on it. Um, and another thing you need to try, the Egyptians have a thing called a pie but it's just thin layers of pastry and it can be sweet, it can be savoury and that was really good. But yeah, very, very affordable for the food. No, no shortage of uh, pastries. Oh no, lots of pastries as well. And speaking of costs, we were there for about three weeks and we spent a bit over, oh, it was between 300 and 350 British pounds a week. So that's about 700 New Zealand dollars and whatever the currencies there are. So we felt that we lived like kings. We, uh, our accommodation for most of it was sort of three or four star. Meals were in restaurants, mm. occasionally on the side of the road or street food. But we lived pretty well, we went for a balloon ride, we cruised down the Nile, mm. and all of that for less than a hundred New Zealand dollars a day. Yeah, so it's definitely an affordable place to go. Um, the other thing people asked us about was the safety issue of being in Egypt, and tourism has been on the wane a little bit in Egypt over the last few years because they have had a few troubles, but we found that it felt really really safe, in fact I was really surprised. The people are extremely friendly, um, some are really genuinely friendly, some are trying to sell you a Faluka ride or sell you this or sell you that, but on the whole um, people were genuinely really really mm. nice weren't they and they did try to help you out a lot. Um, I guess one of the challenges you have when you go to a country like that is they are a developing country and by comparison with the average Egyptian we are extremely wealthy when we go there and people talk about scams and people trying to rip you off but we really felt that if people weren't trying to rip you off they were actually just trying to to make a buck. <laughs> to maximise their profit yeah. that would be the work. And they were pretty good when you said you didn't want their product or you weren't interested in their services. The infrastructure for their um, rubbish collection doesn't really exist, so you've got that problem, and that's sort of hard to ignore, is in your face. Yeah. Um, and the other thing with the animals. Yes. Yeah. The, the animal thing is, is really a little bit confronting in some ways in Egypt because they are very reliant on the camels, on the horses, and on donkeys. Um, for transport, for livelihood, if you, you when you go down the Nile and you watch them, the agriculture, they use donkeys a lot for, for carrying and that sort of stuff. So the animal thing isn't quite what we were used to. Yeah, animal welfare is not mm. what you would expect, but... It's just the way it is, the yeah. only uh, This is the behind the scenes uh, part of Giza. We're about 100 metres from the pyramids, and this is where all the, uh, the horses, the camels, do their thing after hours.
I think we've mentioned the horse and carriage thing before in our Egypt videos, but here in Giza, uh, we are completely surrounded by them. It's an incredibly big business. If you go to the pyramids, they are always offering you a horse and carriage ride, and even around the cities they use them. So as you can see, there are a lot of horses here. You'll see some amazing things, you will meet some really, really lovely people and um, you will have a really, really good time, based on our experiences anyway. And you're amongst the world's premier tourist destination mm. or tourist attractions. Mm.